You're listening to Devo with Uncle Theo. Today, we're going to cover chapters 39 through 41. I have my brother Dustin with me. You ready to hop into text, bro? Yes, sir. Chapter 39, it says, Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, the Egyptian officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the bodyguard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. We need to make sure that we know that Potiphar is not only an officer, but he's the captain of the bodyguard. I want to bring that back up because there's an interesting point here that brings a reality to us that most people may not consider. But look at this. It says, the Lord was with Joseph, so he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Now his master saw that the Lord was with him and how the Lord caused all that he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight and became his personal servant. And he made him overseer of his house and over all that he owned, he put in his charge. It came about that from the time that he made him overseer in his house and over all that he owned, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house on account of Joseph. We got to talk about that. Because Joseph is being called a blessed man. But from the, from the description of anybody who saw Joseph's profile on a PowerPoint presentation, if I put Joseph's life, single parent household, dysfunctional family, sold into slavery, we're about to see that he's falsely accused. So he's a convicted felon, wrongfully accused. And then we put that up against somebody who has a good job, college degree, a nice home, nice kids, nice car. Which life are you picking or which life are you calling blessed? In the flesh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick the nice car, nice kids every time. Exactly. But that's not biblical Christianity, bro. The text calls Joseph blessed. Amen. And so we keep talking about this, but how can we beat in our minds that this is the path that no matter where we are in life, no matter what our circumstances look like, if God is with us, we're blessed. Not if we get good results, not if we're successful based on worldly standards. No, we need that preposition with. If God is with us, we're blessed, bro. Amen. Amen. Yeah, we see Paul's life. Paul is, Ooh, man. man, he's one of the most probably persecuted men in the Bible. And he said, he, he said he's learned to be content in every situation. Amen. But it's something that he learned. And it's something that our boy Joseph's learning too. Bro, so you could call Paul our sensei. He's our Mr. <laughs> Miyagi. We're Daniel's son. Yeah. And he said he had to learn this. Man. How much more for us? Contentment isn't automatic. You don't wake out of bed. I'm saved. I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. I'm regenerated. I'm a content man. I'm a content. No. You got to work at this every day. You got to work at not grumbling, not complaining, trusting the Lord, being thankful for what you have. It's a, if you're comparing it to a car, this isn't an automatic, bro. This isn't a Tesla. You can't self-drive your Christianity, bro. This is a stick shift. This is a manual and you have to work this every day, which is why scripture says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That's not works-based salvation. That's no, you're saved by grace through faith. God did all of that. But in sanctification, you're going to have to do something. Like, you're going to have to do your part. And so I think we miss that a lot, bro. No, absolutely. But let's capture what happens with Joseph. So the, the deck is stacked against him. Nobody would pick this hand if it was dealt to him. And now he's about to be falsely accused here. He's in charge of everything. And now Potiphar's wife comes to him because it tells us in verse 6 that Joseph is handsome in form and appearance. And this lust of the eyes, this attracts Potiphar's wife. And she comes on to him and he says, look, I cannot do this. I love how he word, words this. He words it in verse nine. He says, I could not do this great evil and sin against God. Bro, let's get there with our Christianity. I want to get there. What about you, bro? Yeah, no, absolutely. It, it reminds me of what David's going to say when he sins That's against good. God, That's Bathsheba. Good. And you're right. He, yeah. What was his cry in Psalms 51? He says, you alone, Lord, have I sinned. Man, that is powerful. And I think we all should strive to get there because a lot of times we don't do it because it's yucky. 
we don't do it because, oh, this is not the right thing to do. It's so unethical. It's so immoral. That's true. But, but let's get here. I can't do this great evil because I will sin against God. I think that's the apex, bro. Don't you think? No, absolutely. Knowing who really ultimately who we're sinning against. Amen. And then once we understand that and we start moving our feet towards that's when we learn to be content. We Amen. learn how to be obedient. Those things are learned, not given. Man, that's so good. Let's look down at verse 17. When she comes on to him, she left his garment beside her until her master came home. And this is what she says in verse 17. Then she spoke to him with these words, the Hebrew slave whom you brought to us came into me and made sport of me. And I raised my voice and screamed. He left his garment beside me and fled outside. Now, when the master heard of the words of his wife, which she spoke to him saying, this is what your slave did to me, his anger burned. So Joseph master took him and put him into jail, the place where King's prisoners were confined and he was in the jail. And so let's talk about this because even when he goes in the jail, it says that the Lord was with him, verse 21, and extended kindness to him and gave him favor in the sight of the chief, chief jailer. So he goes to Potiphar house, gets promoted, gets demoted into prison and gets pre promoted even in that sphere that he's in. That's a blessed man, but we wouldn't see that as being blessed. I don't even know if Joseph would have saw that in the moment because you're just suffering one blow after another. And I wanted to talk about this. If somebody, if you're that high ranking of an official and somebody is accused of this act, wouldn't the death penalty be suiting? Like, why does he just put them in jail? We have to think about that. And I, I think I have a good reason of why. That's why I wanted to say, remember the captain of the bodyguard. And because let's walk into verse 40. It says, it came about after these things, the cupbearer and the baker for the king of Egypt Finneth their lord, the king of Egypt. Pharaoh was furious with his two officials, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker. So he put them in confinement in the house of the captain of the bodyguard in the jail, the same place where Joseph was in prison. And the reason I wanted us to hold on to that term, the captain of the bodyguard, at, in verse 1 of chapter 39, it tells us, that Pharaoh is the captain of the bodyguard. So essentially what we have here, if we put our puzzle pieces together, Joseph is in prison in Potiphar's house in the basement. Get this, bro. Potiphar puts Joseph in prison in his own household. And if you look at some scholars work here, they, they come up with a few things saying that most people don't believe that Potiphar bought in to his wife's accusations. Some go even further as far as saying Potiphar may have been a eunuch and his wife was trying to find satisfaction outside of him and he knew that. So he fully didn't believe her. But let's not even go that far. Let's just go with what the text gives us. Bro, he puts him in prison, a man who's convicted of an egregious act in his own house. What does that tell us? To me, that tells me that Potiphar is, I can't not do anything. I got to do something. But this man is blessed. Maybe if I just take him and put him in my basement, <laughs> my house will still be blessed. What do you think about that, bro? I think Potiphar thought he had a lucky rabbit foot. <laughs> I love that, man. That's exactly what I believe. And so let's continue to walk into chapter 40 because now we're setting up the stage for the chief baker and the chief cupbearer. And we need to get an interesting note about a cupbearer. The purpose of a cupbearer back then, a cupbearer would bring the cup to the king and he was basically a taste tester because people would try to put assassinations on kings. And so the chief cupbearer would take the first sip and they would wait and see what happens. So if the cupbearer gets woozy, like, oh, king's like, okay, I'm not drinking that. <laughs> and so they had these guys in place. So cupbearers were very important. So this guy is here. The chief baker is here. So they have dreams here. 
It says in verse five, then the cupbearer and the baker for the king of Egypt who were confined in jail, both had a dream the same night, each man with his own dream and each man with his own interpretation. In verse eight, then they said to him, we have had a dream and there is no one to interpret it. Then Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God? Tell it to me, please. So the chief cupbearer tells him his dream and the chief baker tells him his dream. Let's talk through that. So they both have these dreams. The chief cupbearer has this dream. He told it to Jacob. He said, in my dream, there was a vine in front of me and on the vine, there were three branches. And as it was budding, its blossoms came out and its clusters produced ripe grapes. Now Pharaoh's cup was in my hand. So I took the grapes and squeezed them into Pharaoh's cup and I put the cup into Pharaoh's hand. Then Joseph said to him, this is the interpretation of it. The three branches are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head. And so promotion, like, bro, you're getting out in three days. Pharaoh is going to promote you. He's going to lift up your head. So the chief baker gives his dream. And so he was excited. He was like, oh, man, the chief cupbearer got this favorable dream interpretation. Let me give mine because I know mine is going to be good. So he gives his. And in verse 16, it says, when he saw that the interpretation was favorable, he said to Joseph, I also had my dream. And behold, there were three baskets of white bread on my head. And in the top of the basket, there were some of all sorts of baked food for Pharaoh. And the birds were eating out of the basket on my head. Then Joseph answered and said, this is the interpretation. Within three more days, Pharaoh will lift up your head from you and will hang you on a tree. And so this is kind of funny because he says the exact same thing to the chief baker as he says to the chief cupbearer. He says to the chief cupbearer, hey, Pharaoh's going to lift up your head, promotion. But then he says to the chief baker, hey, Pharaoh's going to lift up your head from above you. <laughs> and so he's going to hang him. And so it's like, wow. And so we see it comes about on the third day. Everything that he prophesied happened in verse 20. Thus it came about on the third day was Pharaoh's birthday, and he made a feast for all his servants. And he lifted up the head of the chief cupbearer and the head of the chief baker among his servants. He restored the chief cupbearer to his office and he put the cup into Pharaoh's hand, but he hanged the chief baker just as Joseph has interpreted to them. Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot about him. Think about this. Joseph is, we don't want to infer too much, but you can see that he's trusting the Lord and that he's content, but he still wants to be vindicated. He still wants justice. And so even in the interpretation right after, he says, hey, remember me, though. Remember me when you talk to Pharaoh. But he doesn't get remembered. Talk to me about that request. Remember me. But also the chief cupbearer not remembering him. What are your thoughts there? No, I think that, of course, in the moment, Joseph was shooting a request out. But at the same time, I think it serves a bigger purpose. Because when he doesn't remember him, in a minute when we'll see, I think it we'll see that God supernaturally made the cupbearer forget. Wow, man. That's good. And we're talking about dreams, and we move from the dream of the chief cupbearer and the baker to Pharaoh's dream. And it says here, now it happened at the end of two full years that Pharaoh had a dream. We have to mark two full years because a lot of times we think the Lord should move in our life at, on a certain time frame. And two years have gone by and the Lord still hadn't released Joseph from prison. And I think we could take a lot of wisdom from this to always trust God's timing and to never try to put God on our timeline. And what does then, what you said, contentment. So Pharaoh has these dreams. And in these dreams, Jacob interprets these dreams. So he has the first dream that there are seven cows, sleek and fat, 
and they grazed on the marsh grass. And then seven other cow cows came ugly and gaunt. And they stood by the other cows on the bank of the Nile. And the ugly and gaunt cows ate up the sleek and fat ones. And Pharaoh awoke. And then he had a, a second dream. And there were seven ears of grain that came up on a single stalk, plump and good. Then behold, seven ears, thin and scorched, by the east wing sprouted up after them, and the thin ears swallowed up the seven. So he wanted an interpretation, and he called forth for the magicians, because his spirit was troubled. And the wise man, and Joseph told his dreams, but there was no one who could interpret them for him. Then the chief cupbearer was like, aha, I remember. He said, I would make mention today of my own offenses. Pharaoh was furious with his servants, and he put me in confinement in the house of the captain of the bodyguard, both me and the chief baker. We had a dream on the same night, he and I. Each of us dreamed according to the interpretation of his own dream. Now a Hebrew youth, remember that, a Hebrew youth, Joseph's ethnicity is brought up here, which is important, was with us there, and the servant of the captain of the bodyguard we related them to him, and he interpreted our dreams for us. To each one, he interpreted according to his own dream. The chief cupbearer recounts what happened there, and Pharaoh calls for Joseph, and he hurriedly brought him out of the dungeon. And when he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, it's funny that he shaved himself before he appeared before Pharaoh. I think that's an important note. We'll talk about the Hyksos later. And that shaving helps us out with that people group. He comes before Pharaoh and Joseph interprets his dream. He says, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh the favorable answer. Wow, bro. You see that humility, how he's trusting in the Lord. This is our God. Joseph said to Pharaoh's dreams are one in the same. The, the seven good cows are seven years and the seven good ears are seven years. They're one in the same. There's going to be seven years of famine, and there's going to be a seven-year surplus. Why does he hear the same dream twice? It says here in verse 31, so the abundance will be unknown in the land because of the subsequent famine, for it will be very severe. Now, as for the repeating of the dream to Pharaoh twice, it means that the matter is determined by God, and God will quickly bring it about. So hearing the same dream twice means that it was it's definite. It'll surely happen, and it'll happen quickly. And here's the solution. So now let Pharaoh look for a man discerning and wise and set him over the land, and let Pharaoh take action and appoint overseers. Let the food become a reserve for the land of the seven years of famine, which would occur in the land of Egypt, so that the land will not perish during the famine. Now the proposal seemed good to Pharaoh and to all his servants. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has informed you of all of this, there is no one so discerning and wise as you are. You shall be over my house. And according to your command, all my people shall do homage. Only in the throne, I will be greater than you. That's second in command, bro. Talk to me about this promotion because we'll ride the chapter out here and look at his age. We started out, he was 17 years old. So it says in verse 46, now Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. So we have 13 years passed by. And if you can estimate, we don't know how many years he was in prison. You can say estimate maybe around a decade. That's a lot of time to sit on ice. That's a lot of time to develop. That's a lot of time where people would say Joseph wasn't a blessed man, but God calls him blessed. And bro, 13 years that passed by. Talk to me about that, because even in our development, we don't like the 13 year plan. We like the 60 day plan. But God had Joseph on a 13 year plan. It's beautiful because we joke a lot and say that we are we like our microwave faith. Right. But if we had microwave faith, if we could just say that if we had it and it was just given to us. I, I think that it would hurt the love that we have for God because we're building not only is it, he's building character in us. In reverse, he's building our faith in him. And so 
we can see this with Joseph, I believe. Man, that's so good. And we ride the chapter out. The famine comes. It says in verse 50, now before the year the famine came, the two sons were born to Joseph. And we need to talk about these two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. You see both of those in verse 51. And we'll just mark those names. We'll just mark those names and ride out there for it says, God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. So glory is given to God, even in his circumstances. And may we all be like Joseph yeah. in our walk. Amen. Let's pick up next time with day 15. Right.